Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to chapel today. Today is a special day. I love senior chapels because it's a sign of accomplishment and it's a sign that uh, perseverance does work and that you can reach that goal of, of finishing. And many of you know today is Brother Tanner's senior chapel and we're excited to celebrate that with him. There's numerous guests with us today and I'm always nervous about this because you're going to leave somebody out but we have uh, Brother Tommy Floyd with us, one of our trustees. We have Tony Hall, a, uh, an alumnus. And I look around John Filatico, an alumnus here, a former trustee, Brother Bill Duncan, the pastor at First Baptist uh, in New Tazewell, some other folks here and a whole bunch of Tanner's family. Oh, I forgot, you're not even late, Mr. Early. You, we're so glad to have uh, uh, Justin Early. That's just an inside joke. Now, he was never late. Don't, don't leave here telling that he was never late. That's just one of my dumb, corny jokes I always aggravated him with when I had him in class. But uh, another uh, alum for us, so, so glad to have you guys here. And Tanner, I'm sure you'll introduce your family in a little while. So let me say thank you to all of you for being here, as well as those of you that are joining us uh, via live stream and uh, various means of technology. When Tanner first asked me to introduce him, let me first say thank you, because I'm honored to be able to do that. I, I love Tanner. We have some similar interests, some things in the outdoors and fishing and, and those sort of activities, and the fact that uh, God just knit our hearts together during his time here and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to invest in you and thankful for your investment in my life as well. It's hard to believe that Tanner is at this point of graduation. He came here bringing some hours with him, started in, in the spring of 2020, and now here we are facing his graduation. Uh, he has uh, a tie to campus that many of you may not know about, but his grandfather was a Clear Creek student in the early 50s. Um, so it's, it's always amazing to see how God uses uh, what I often call legacy students, uh, those who follow in uh, someone who's close to them, their, their family or a close friend in coming to Clear Creek. So Tanner, we're so honored to have you in that way and we're thankful that you're fulfilling and walking in the legacy that your grandfather left you. Tanner serves as a student body vice president, and he also serves as student pastor at First Baptist New Tazewell. Now, his greatest accomplishment <laughs> since he's been a student here is probably Miss Lena. Where, where are you at? Are you in here somewhere? There she is. So uh, he came as a single, and he's leaving married. Uh, Clear Creek has a way of doing that for a lot of folks, doesn't it? But it's been exciting to watch Tanner grow. Tanner's a good student. He's a student of the Word. He loves people. And he loves to share his love for the Lord with those that he comes in contact with. I hear many times, Tanner, I'll get a text message from someone from First New Tazewell. And that they'll say, you know, thank you for, uh, uh, for recommending Tanner. We're proud of Tanner. I hear all these things about Tanner, Tanner, Tanner. Uh, so we are proud of what you are doing there we're thankful for how God's blessed you, how he's called you, how he's used you. And we here at Clear Creek, we're honored to have a minute part in that, uh, in your training for ministry. And we trust you're going to continue to do that. And our master's program would be a good way. That's my shameless plug. Uh, uh, yeah. I almost embarrassed myself. Let's... Let's pray together as we open our chapel. And Tanner, know that I'm excited to hear what you have to say and how God's going to speak through you this day. We love you, we're proud of you, and uh, we're thankful for you. Let's pray together. Father, this day, Lord, we thank you for the celebration of this senior chapel. We thank you for a young man like Tanner McDowell. We thank you for your giftedness upon him. We thank you for your call upon him. We thank you... Uh, Lord, for the, the natural and the, uh, the evident gifts you've bestowed upon him. And Lord, we also praise you that you've sharpened those. And Lord, you continuing to do that and, and use him for your honor and your glory. And Father, this day as we celebrate this accomplishment, Lord, uh, this day that we celebrate the fact that, that Tanner's completed and in, in the process of completing this journey of an undergraduate theological education, we glorify your name in that. We pray that you would anoint him. We pray that you would calm his nerves, give him peace, clarity of mind, and Lord, give him clarity of tongue, we pray. 
And Father, we thank you for all of our guests here this day. And Lord, we ask you that as we worship you, we'd worship in spirit and in truth. Lord, give us your presence. And Lord, may we discern your power. Lord, would you be an ever-present help during this time of need. We pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. And amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together and worship our Savior. Praise church. And as we now enter into our time of prayer, um, I just want to ask everyone to be praying for our student body. Um, this week we have had massive illness, all different things from flu, COVID to um, doctor's appointments and everything in between. And so at the beginning of the semester, that's very hard for faculty, staff, students alike. And so this morning, during this time of prayer, let's specifically call out to the healer our Lord Jesus Christ. So pray with me this morning.
most gracious Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning, Lord, and I'm compelled right now by your Holy Spirit just to pray specifically, Lord, for Clear Creek Baptist Bible College and our health. God, this week I have gotten more emails than I've ever gotten probably my entire time here over sickness, people in hurting and in need, Lord. And God, I just pray for your healing hand, Lord, upon our students, our staff, our faculty, Lord. Keep us strong, Lord, and healthy to do what you've called us to do. And God, we give you and you alone the glory for it. And Lord, we are so thankful that we serve a Savior who is a victor over sickness and death. And God, that we can come before your throne boldly and ask, Lord, for your healing touch. So God, even in the midst of sickness and in weakness, Lord, we will not stop worshiping you. We will give you praise and glory, Lord, because you are worthy of it. And so this morning, as we continue in this time of worship, and we sing what we believe as believers in Jesus Christ, I pray we don't do it out of repetition, but out of truly declaring in front of the world that we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. So bless us now as we continue in this time and heal those that are in need. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray this. Amen. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. Holy Spirit, our 
God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Yes, I believe in the name of Jesus. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me gracious heavenly father we thank you for that blood or that blood that came down from calvary lord to shed upon us lord when we're all the best we could offer your word says it's just filthy rags but praise the lord you view us through the lens of jesus christ 
And God, we thank you for this. We thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. And Tanner coming now to get to do his senior chapel. Come on him boldly, Holy Spirit. Help him speak what you would have him to speak, Lord. And help us be attentive to hear. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray this. Amen. Well, good morning. Chapel looks a whole lot different from this perspective. Let me guarantee you that. My freshman year when I got here, I, Justin Early was, I think, a sophomore at the time. and He looked at me. He was excited about preaching in senior chapel as a sophomore. And I looked at him and said, buddy, you're crazy. I ain't never going to do that. Well, look at me now. Before I get started this morning, I just want to list off a bunch of thank yous. If I cry, don't worry about it. I do it all the time. Don't believe me. Just ask anybody at First Baptist. Uh, Dr. Goodman, thank you for your introduction. I love you. You're my brother. Too late. <laughs> to the rest of the faculty, staff, I'm honored to sit up under you, to learn from you. Your commitment to God's word is amazing. And I pray that I can hold that same commitment in my own life. I pray that I'm able to be faithful to God's call in my life as you've been faithful to God's call in yours. To the staff who works behind the scenes at Clear Creek, you keep this place running. A lot of us don't see it as students. I'm blessed to be able to work in this building. I'm just so thankful for you. And I know you don't get told thanks enough. So thank you. To my fellow students, our friendships, memories, those who are online who are sick, I'm praying for you. But thank you for just being there, uplifting me. Andrew, I mean, we talk in your office all the time. Thank you, brother. To my pastor, Brother Bill Duncan. Thirty plus years of ministry sets me down to his office the first day and goes, listen, I'm not here to be over top of you. I want you to learn from my mistakes so you don't make the same ones I did. From the meetings we've had, I'm thankful for you, our friendship, our mentorship. For First Baptist, for allowing me to grow in the call of God on my life, for being forgiving when I messed up, for loving me through the rough times. <sighs> Denealy's Creek, Missionary Baptist Church, back in the holler in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Thank you for affirming the call of my life, for giving me opportunities just to preach God's word, even though I might have gave you the best seven minutes of my life and <laughs> preached through Genesis to Revelation numerous times. Thank you so much for giving me those opportunities. Brother Tommy and Brother Tony, thank you. Brother Tony, if, for those of you who don't know, I accepted my call into ministry at a uh, church camp at Laurel Lake Baptist Camp, and Brother Tony was a camp pastor. And that next week, I went to his office. He's like, what do you want to do now? I said, well, brother, I have no idea. He said, well, there's a place called Clear Creek. And we loaded up in his uh, green Kia Soul at that time. He's since upgraded to a red Kia Soul. And me and Brother Tommy uh, and Brother Tony headed over here and we watched the chapel and I talked to Doug. And it was like an own personal little preview day that day. And I, I knew as soon as I ran in the corner that this was a place God would have me be at. Didn't know it would be this short of a time, but I'm thankful for it nonetheless. To my family, Dr. Goodman said I had a lot of family here with me, and I do. Uh, my Aunt Pam, who uh, I remember one Wednesday night, it was in the middle of COVID, she was probably the only one in the audience other than our pastor at the time, and I was preaching to a cell phone, and she walked up to me. She goes, Tanner, I almost didn't come to church tonight, but the Lord was telling me I better stay. And it just just the relationship we have, thank you, Miss, my Aunt Pam. To my Nana, who I love so much, if you know a story about me, I've told you about her. Uh, she was here when Elsie Kelly was here. And she knew Elsie Kelly when she was a little girl, and just her and her phone calls every day, and her support and her love. To my mom, 
that would always make me go to church, even though I never wanted to as a little boy, to when I would wake up early in the morning on, before I was supposed to, and I would walk out, she'd be sitting at the kitchen table with the Bible open. <laughs> Thank you for that bottle. <laughs> this is where it gets bad, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lena. You had the nail on the head. Best thing I ever accomplished. Well, been here. <laughs> Thank you for your support, your love. Even when I make dumb decisions, tell me get back on the right path. <sighs> but most importantly, I wouldn't have any of these people in my life if it wasn't for our Lord and Savior. For his, for his blood shed on that cross. I wouldn't be the man I am today if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for him being faithful in my life to call me to do what I'm doing. And this morning, you didn't come here to hear, listen to me cry. You didn't come here this morning to listen to see how thankful I am. Most of you came here this morning because, well, you had to. It's required by the school to graduate. You must pass eight full semesters with a bachelor's degree of chapel. And I don't want to deprive you of that this morning. So if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12? And while you're turning there, I want to tell you a brief story. It was my second semester. I think it was the sixth, sixth chapel of the year. And there was a, the chapel speaker that day was preaching a sermon where he laid out the qualifications from Timothy or Titus chapter 1 of godly leadership. And one of those qualifications he had listed out was discipline, that of discipline. And what he, what he said was really stuck out to me. He said that we, as men and women who are called of God, should have a life as a disciplined disciple who, who is faithful to our calling and should study the Word of God to glorify God, not just to get a degree, not just to get a piece of paper to hang on our walls, not just to get a grade, but everything we do, we should study the Word of God for His glory. He specifically used the term that when he was a student here at Clear Creek, that he noticed a lot of his fellow students and then even fellow co-workers in ministry who would be dogging it, and Dr. Schmidt does not like that slang term he told me when I turned in my outline. So I told him I cut it down. I'll, I'll only use it one time. But he used this to, to put, portray that people weren't giving it their, their all. They weren't fully devoting themselves to their studies, to ministry, and to the Lord. And as we're along this theological journey that we call as Clear Creek, we need to be growing in the knowledge of both God's word, but also his will. So this morning, I want to read to you Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And if you would please stand with me in honor and reverence of the reading of the word of God this morning. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us pray this morning. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you today, Lord, just thankful, God, for your calling upon our lives. God, thankful for your word that has stood the test of time. Lord, your word that is holy and fallible, is perfect. God, you breathed out this word, and I'm so thankful, Lord, that you have preserved it for us to have. Lord, the word that you have given me to speak this morning, Lord, let it not be for myself, Lord, but let it be from you and you alone. Let me hide myself behind your cross and speak to the truth that is your word. God, be with us this day and let us all, including myself, respond to this message in the way that you would have us respond. I pray all these things in your son's most gracious heavenly name, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So this morning, I would like to present to you this passage. This passage we see here is that you and I and anyone who is called by God is to proclaim the gospel. And in order to do that, we must be a disciplined disciple. I've entitled my message this morning, Disciplines of a Disciple. You see, we must 
be disciplined disciples who remain to, faithful to God throughout the totality of our ministry, but especially right here while we prepare. The author of the book of Hebrews, who is very highly debated, so I'm not going to get into that this morning, but the author of the book of Hebrews does something very special for us here in these two verses. He uses his words to paint a picture of a race, a race where all the contestants' names have been entered into the race, and yet nobody has yet taken a step. The race has not yet begun. The gun has not went off to say go. And this is the very same position the Hebrews in which he is writing to finds that themselves in. Many of them are young believers, just newly accepted Christ into their life, and they haven't begun to move. They haven't began to work for the Lord yet. Many of them were sitting at the gate, looking forward at the course laid before them and saying, oh boy, this doesn't look good. People have died for this Jesus? Oh man, I don't know about all this. And some of them probably even have thoughts of quitting before they even ever got started. The author here wanted to begin with a little bit of encouragement to those Hebrews who had those thoughts and in a way encouraging us. He reminded them of the great cloud of witnesses that was surrounding them, almost like you would see in a Colosseum where a race would take place. They would be down in the center and the Colosseum would be full and everybody would be cheering on those runners. John Phillips in his Exploring Hebrews commentary calls this the stadium is how he entitles this verse. He calls this a stadium because all the people in the stadium, of course, would be cheering on those who were getting ready to run. Now, we all know the great cloud of witnesses the author of Hebrews is talking about. If you don't know who they are, just flip back, read through Hebrews chapter 11, and you will see a list of names such as Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, so on and so forth, until he gets to where he says towards the end of the chapter, and what more shall I say? For if time, for time will fail me if I tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of, of David and Samuel and the prophets. He's saying, look, these are just a few, but there's so many more that comes after them. I don't have enough time or my hand will give out on me if I continue writing about the faithfulness of these men who are up surrounding you, encouraging you in your walk. Essentially, what he is reminding us is that. I just said that. Never mind. I got ahead of myself. Breathe. Okay. Now, in this word painted picture of a race, we see the witnesses cheering them on. And but what we need to be careful here is not to say that all of heaven is looking down, cheering us on through life. Because I hate to break it to you, all of heaven isn't looking down upon us today. All of heaven is worshiping and glorifying God with their every breath. And boy, how I long to be there with them. You see, but what we have to understand is that we ought to be encouraged by the not we ought to be encouraged that although the course laid before us might look difficult that although the course might look defeating and that although the course might make us dread what is about to come we can be encouraged to look at those who have done already completed the course because after all if you look back in chapter 11 what are the two words we find before every single name I already mentioned by faith they completed this course not because they were good enough, not because they could, but because they had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, or specifically in the Old Testament, faith in God to preserve them and lead them along the way. And just like many of you and myself, this semester, we're only in the second week. And I don't know about you, and I know probably the seniors that are alongside of me can say, syllabus shock hit harder this semester than any semester I've ever been here. <laughs> Thank you, John. I remember the Friday Sakai got unloaded for me to look at. I clicked it. I pulled it up my office. I looked at it. I said, oh, boy. I don't know if I can do all this. But then I looked back to these two verses, which I've made life verses in my life. And I thought to myself, hey, other people have done it. I can do it. If I'm faithful to the one who has called me, he will see me through it. Amen. Faithful is he who calls you to see you through 1 Thessalonians 5.25. You see, because there will be one day when we step into ministry, 
and we don't need to throw it away here, but we can be encouraged because one day when we step into ministry, ask anybody who pastors in here, there are going to be days in ministry where it's going to look, when things are coming at you, when there's an avalanche rolling down the hill and it's going to be easier to step out of the way, to throw it in the back, to quit, to leave the church and go do something else than it is to stay, persevere, be faithful and push on. Am I right? There's going to be days like that. So the days aren't necessarily going to get easier, but if we're faithful, we can be encouraged. Not only can we look towards those who have been successful in this life by being faithful to the Lord, we can look to those who have failed. I mentioned earlier how my pastor had looked at me and said, I don't want you to mess up. I don't want you to slip up. I don't want you to fail in the same ways I have done. I want you to be encouraged to don't do it this way, but do it this way. We can look to those who have quit the race before the race even started. We can look to those who along the way decided, you know what, this is too rough. Let me get out of it now. And we can even look to those who have allowed sin to creep in to disqualify them from finishing the race they were so called to do. We can look to those and say, you know what? He was a good man of God, but he allowed sin to slip into his life. Lord, let me not allow that sin to slip into my life so I can be faithful to complete. You see, we can look at these not in the sense to put them down, but for us to learn from them. And this is the great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. I forgot, Brother Scott told me we had thousands of alumni that have went to this college. You know what that means? We can do it too. You know, Christian theology too, it's a heavy course. We can get through it. English Comp 1, it's a hard course. Trust me, you can get through it. Trust me, I'm not an English person and I got through it. You can do it too. But you see, we can be encouraged to remain faithful by knowing there have been faithful ones who have gone before us and looking to them for encouragement. But it's all nice to begin the race very encouraged, very pepped up, very ready to go. But there's two things that we see in this passage that's following this encouragement that we must do in order to run the race faithfully. The first thing is seen in the very second part, right after the great cloud of witnesses in the first one. It says, let us, lay a, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Excuse me. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You see, in order for you and I to be a disciple of Christ, to be a disciplined disciple, we must lay aside everything that is keeping us from being fully focused on the ministry God has called us to. And that includes our preparation for that ministry. You see, the author here encourages newly young believers in the faith, the Hebrews, to lay aside the things that hinder them from running the race that is set before them with endurance. I love what Josh, Dr. Smith said this morning in our transition to ministry class. Ministry isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. We have to take our time and run with endurance. If we start out with a sprint, well, I don't sprint very often, so I'll run out of breath pretty fast. But I remember my second semester. My first semester, spring of 2020, we all know what happened about spring break. We all went online. We all got moved off campus. But right before spring break, I went out and bought me a brand new PlayStation. I was excited. I was ready to go. And I played that thing through the rest of that semester, finished, moved back on campus in the summer, played it all summer, and classes started that fall. I sat down, and Justin knows he was playing it with me, and so was Peyton, who slipped in back there in the back. Thank you, brother, for being here. But... Um, I was sitting there and I was playing it and what I began to notice as my second semester got underway was that my grades were starting to fall, my ability to read, I wasn't as intent on my reading, and, but you know what I was intent on? Playing that PlayStation. So you know what I chose to do? I chose that for the best option for me was to just get rid of it because what good was it going to do if I could play that all night but I was going to fail all my courses, if I was going to fail at what God had called me here to do? So I set aside myself to just go and sell it. And I'm not going to tell you who I sold it to because they're still sitting in this room. <laughs> but I will tell you, he's been faithful to do his work and get everything complete. But I'm not telling you that gaming systems are bad. I'm not telling you that you have to get rid of all the things that are fun in your life. But what I am telling you, if we take something and we place it higher than our Lord, higher than our calling, it's no good for us. I was listening to Mark Sotomayor. Everybody knows him up. We were at Heritage Christian Academy a few months ago. He was doing chapel. And he 
he taught a lesson on the rich young ruler who came to Christ asking how to get into heaven. And this is what he encouraged those kids to do. He said, I'm not telling you to throw it away just because you have it. I'm telling you that if it comes in between you and your walk with the Lord, get rid of it. Because nothing can be more important than our walk with the Lord. You see, it can't be a friendship. If it's a friendship, we have to lay that friendship to a side. If it's a gaming system, we have to lay it to a side. If it's a job, I'm sorry, the Lord's faithful to provide, lay it to the side. Nothing can come in front of, in the way and come first other than God in our lives. You see, when I first got here, I struggled with the fact that Somerset is my home. That's where I was born. That's where I was raised. And Brother Alan Sanders told me something my fourth or fifth day here. He goes, Brother, wherever God calls you is your home. You see, we can't let our home deter us from being in God's will. We have to keep God's will at the forefront of our mind. And, if we, and I love what Dr. Goodman said last week in his chapel. Let us be who God has called us to be where he has called us to be. You see, we are to be faithful to him who has called us. But let me be honest with you. There's a couple of things that will never get in the way with your relationship with the Lord. Very first and foremost, your quiet time will never get in the way of your relationship with the Lord. Whole, reading your Bible, keeping up with a Bible reading plan will never get in the way of your relationship with the Lord. Going to church and gathering together with his saints will never get in the way with your relationship with the Lord. These things were created by God for us to grow in our relationship with him, not to deter us from spending more time with him. You see, if we want to grow in his knowledge of his word and his will, we must be, spend time with him. You see, not only must we lay aside the things and s that slow us down, the sin that so entraps us and keeps us from being faithful to God, we must also keep our eyes on the prize. We must keep our eyes on Christ. Read with me verse 2. Verse 2 says, Fixing our eyes upon Christ, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and I sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, in order to be a disciplined disciple of Christ, you must keep your eyes on Christ and do not look away. I'm reminded of the story that comes from the book of Matthew. We see Peter and the disciples. Jesus had just finished feeding a lot of people. He had sent them away, sent the disciples into a boat. We all know the story very well. Jesus goes alone to pray. The boat is a long distance from the shore, the Bible tells us, and the waves are battering against the boat. And the disciples look out, and who do they see walking towards them? They see Jesus walking towards them, and they're frightened. They're scared. I'm, if it's in the middle of the night, I've been on the middle of the lake in the middle of the night with a fog rolling around. It's a pretty scary place to be if you see somebody floating on the water walking towards you. But Peter calls out to the Lord and says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And the Lord said, what? Come. So Peter takes that step out of the boat and he starts walking to, towards the Lord. But he became frightened by the waves, by the wind that is surrounding him. And what happened? He began to sink, right? I'm reminded by this story numerous times in my own life where I've taken a step out in faith towards God. When I'm walking towards him and then I get distracted by something going on around me. Maybe it's something like a ball game or maybe something that I enjoy doing, fishing or hunting or whatever it might be. But I get distracted and what happens? I begin to sink. My studies begin to fall. My lessons for my youth on Sunday nights aren't up to par where I would like them to be. Why? Because I'm distracted by the things of this world. I'm not keeping my eyes focused on the one thing that is most important of all. So what I've, what I've learned is that every time that happens, the Lord is faithful to be there, to reach out. But why should we keep our eyes on Christ? Well, you don't have to listen to me tell you. Listen to the author of the book of Hebrews. He tells us we keep our eyes on Christ because he, because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It tells us he went to the cross to bear our burdens, our shame, our sin, not because we deserved it, but because he loves us. He tells us that he is the author and the perfecter of our faith. We are to look to him because there is no other faith to be found on this planet that can enter us into the kingdom of heaven except that by which is Jesus Christ. 
You see, we cannot get into heaven unless we have placed our faith in Christ. And he reminds us of that here. But not only that is our faith created in Christ, our faith is perfect in Christ. It's something that you and I can never be. It's something that you and I will never be unless we have our faith in Christ who will one day glorify us when we enter the kingdom of heaven. But not only that, it tells us he, dis- he despised shame. People hated him. And you know what we're promised? Are we promised a good life? No. Are we promised a happy life? No. We're promised that if the world hated me, they will hate you too. So we need to go into this world ready to face that hate. But not only that, he sat down, he is sitting down at the right hand of the Father waiting to come back to rapture his church, to bring us to heaven with him so that we can dwell with him, so that we can live with him, but most importantly, so we can worship with him with that great cloud of witnesses. You see, one day we're going to be a part of that number. We're going to be a part of the great cloud of witnesses. But you see, are we ever going to be perfect at it? No. Not on this side of eternity. But praise God for the moment that we ever begin to sing. For the moment we take our eyes off him, we begin worrying about the things of this world. He's always there to reach out and to rescue us once again, just like he was Peter. You see, in order for you and I to be a disciplined disciple of Christ, here's the three things we must do. We must realize that first off, it's possible. And we need to look to those who have gone before us for encouragement. Second of all, we need to remove the things that are holding us back from being faithful. And third of all, and most important of all, if we want to do the first two, we must fixate our eyes upon Christ and not let them move, not let them, not let anything take them off. So this morning, I just want to pray over us. And most gracious heavenly Father, Lord God, again, I come to you. Lord, I'm so humbled and I'm so thankful, Lord, for the opportunity you have given me to preach your word this morning. Lord, verses that you have revealed to me that I have held close to my heart throughout my time here at Clear Creek since I accepted your call on my life three or four years ago. God, I pray, Lord, that I will never forget these verses, Lord, that I will remember, Lord, that it is possible to be faithful because there have been faithful men and women who have gone before me. Lord, that it is that I need to release all the things that are holding me back, Lord, as you bring them to my mind, Lord, not put it off, but Lord, do it immediately, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you will give me the strength to fixate my eyes on you at all moments in my life, Lord, that I will never deter from keeping my eyes on you throughout this journey called life. God, may each and every single one of us in this room run the race of ministry, run the race of Christianity, Lord, faithfully. Lord, may each and every single one of us be found a disciplined disciple who is so in love with you, Lord, that we just make other people fall in love with you even more after we leave their presence. God, be with us as we depart today, Lord. I'm so thankful for your call. I pray all these things in your son's most gracious, heavenly, and wonderful name. Amen.